Amen. You may be seated. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris, and I am the lead pastor here at Redeemer Baptist Church, and we are glad that each and every one of you are here with us today. It's my privilege to open God's Word to you today, so I invite you to open up your copy of God's Word, if you brought one with you, to the book of Luke. If you didn't bring one with you, there's always a Bible in the seat back in front of you that you can pick up and use, or if you are tech savvy, you can open up the YouVersion Bible app and uh, hit the events function, and you'll be able to pull up all of the sermon notes and follow along with us today. We're going to be reading an encounter that Jesus had with two sisters named Martha and Mary. And this is one of several encounters with this family that are recorded in Scripture. It's not the only one, and we'll be taking a look at a couple of the other encounters along the way today as well. We are towards the tail end of our series that we have entitled Daughters of Eve. We're looking at great women of faith and seeing how they interacted with the grace that God shows each one of us and how they exemplified certain qualities of character that we want to emulate but recognize we need to encounter God in order to have. So we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42 today. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. As you look at this story, there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it and think about it, and I think that a lot of times when we're reading through this story, we get distracted and we get focused on the wrong things. In fact, I would say the majority of Christians tend to fall into error when they read about this encounter. We think the story is about things that it's not about, and we miss the main point. So I'm going to tell you right up front that this encounter between Jesus and Mary and Martha is about one thing. It's about worship. That's what it's about. And when we fail to see that, we're going to miss all that God has to teach us in this passage. So today, we're going to see, through our study, uh, several things. We're going to see, first off, why this is about worship and why we should be worshiping. We're going to see how our hearts guide our lives to wander away from worship and why we don't make worship the central reality of our lives. We're going to talk briefly about the way of worship and what does it mean to actually worship God with all of our lives. And then we're going to talk about who is the right and worthy object of worship. Okay? So we've got the fact why we're going to worship, what causes us to wander away from it, the way of worship, and who is worthy of worship. But first I need to make my case to you that this is about worship, right? And we can do that by exploring why this is about worship. A lot of people, when they come to this passage, they interpret it with several different errors. Uh, the first error that's very common is to look at this and say, the lesson I'm supposed to take away is that worship is better than action or good works. So this is a long tradition of the error of the, reading this passage this way in the church. There was a group of men back about 300 years after Christ. They were called the patristic monastics, okay? And what these guys did was they said that the real Christian life, the really great Christian life, is what you do when you're worshiping God. And so they read this story, and they said, Mary is the one we should emulate. Martha's in this world are very bad. We shouldn't try and follow them at all. We shouldn't be like them. We shouldn't be doing work. The real spiritual life is found 
and just simply worshiping. And so they would go and live out in the desert and they would live on big columns in the middle of the desert. They would climb up on top and they would spend all day long meditating on God. And that was considered the ideal Christian life. And people who did work for a living would go and bring them food so they didn't starve to death on the columns, right? Now there's a problem with this ideal because that is not the way Scripture teaches us we should be worshiping. In fact, I'm going to argue today that worship is encompassing everything in life. In fact, one way you can see that is the way Jesus himself taught. Take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, and you'll see these words. In the same way... Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus is saying this, how you act when you're not just contemplating me is a reflection of what God is worth. It's about praising God. When we do work, we're to be leading other people and ourselves to worship. So worship is not in opposition to good works, and it's not the better way. And by the way, the way this shows up now, almost 2,000 years after Christ, is that there are all kinds of movements within evangelicalism and within Christianity where people still believe this. Oh, what I really need to do as a Christian is I just need to stand there in a worship service and meditate on Jesus. And that's where true worship happens when the music overwhelms me and the bass is thumping in my chest. That's how I know I'm really worshiping God. Well, you know what that does? That means the majority of your week, you're not worshiping God. Is that really what you think Christianity is about? You think that you're not worshiping God if you're serving other people? So that's an error. That's not what this passage is teaching us. The second error is that worship is different from service. Uh, And this also has a long history within church life. People have used this story to say, some of us are Marthas and some of us are Marys. And we all know that the Marys are the good ones, right? Because Jesus rebukes Martha in this passage. And the Marthas are like, oh yeah, well listen up, you Marys. Guess what? You don't get anything done without us. What if I told you that's actually not what this story is about? That worship and service are not actually two different things, but the same thing. That in our service we should be worshiping, and in our worship we should be serving. And that in fact that is the thing that Jesus is actually trying to teach. You can see this in the life of Christ exemplified all over the place. Uh, One place, just go to Matthew chapter 4, and you can see that Jesus in his own life exemplified this kind of concept. He goes throughout Galilee, and what's he doing? He's teaching in the synagogues. There he is in church and worship, and he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and, and what? And he's healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Now let me ask you the question. Was Jesus ever not worshiping? Was he ever not worshiping? So you have to think about this. Because if Jesus is only worshiping when he's teaching in the synagogues, then that's what our lives look like. But if Jesus is worshiping when he's touching lepers and healing them and feeding the hungry and ministering to people, if he's worshiping in all of life, then worship is not different from service. And when we are serving, we ought to be worshiping. And when we are worshiping, we ought to be serving. They are not separate things. The third way of interpreting this passage that's an error is that to say that worship should always be simple. That true worship is always stripped down and that we try to make it too big. Now, again, I admit that sometimes we can try to make worship a lot about us, but one way of interpreting this passage wrongly is to say what Jesus is saying to Martha is, Martha, I don't need a buffet. You're busy trying to create a potluck. I just needed one dish, and I just need you to sit here. And this really appeals to all the angsty, young worship leaders. Because they want this moment to just be, oh, so sincere, and you just need an acoustic guitar and one voice, and it should be very, very slow if it's worshipful and earnest, and you have to be, you know, just like dredging up the deepest emotions with every word that you can have, and that's what makes worship 
Good. That is not what this passage is teaching. Because guess what? Jesus believes in extravagant worship. And there are ways and times when we should be giving God very difficult, very elaborate kinds of worship. Um, you can see this, by the way, a little bit later on. We're going to talk about this encounter. Uh, Jesus is going to have an encounter with Mary in which she's going to break open a bottle of perfume that cost a year's salary and she's going to pour it over his head and over his feet and then she's going to do a worship service by taking her hair down and wiping his feet with her hair. There's nothing simple about this moment. There's nothing that is cheap about this moment. This is an all-in with every moment of my life type of encounter. And let me tell you something. Sometimes in the church we need to have simple worship and sometimes we need to recognize that we need to be willing to give everything that we've got and every talent and every aspect of administration should be applied to the very work of worship. So if those are three common errors, what is the truth of this passage and what's it teaching us about why we should worship? I'll give you three reasons. We're going to spend most of our time here, and then we're going to look at those other things I was talking about earlier. We're going to spend most of our time talking about three reasons or three truths about why we should be worshiping. The first one is that worship is always our greatest work. For every one of us, for every person, worship is always our greatest work. Jesus says to Martha, now let's look at what he actually said. Martha, Martha, for those of you Brady Bunch fans, it's not Marsha, Marsha. Okay, I know some of you were thinking it. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. There is something that is necessary for every Christian life. And you're not doing it right now, Martha. Mary is doing it, but it's not just found in the actual outer act of what she's doing. He's saying, Martha, you could be doing preparing dinner and you're not worshiping me. Worship is not just what we do when we do worship singing. It's not what some of you like to skip by coming in late to church. Which, by the way, you are commanded to do, to sing. By the way, you know that, right? imperatives throughout your Bible where you are ordered as Christians to sing unto the Lord. Some of you are like, well, I don't like singing. What does that have to do with it? <laughs> Nothing. There's lots of things we don't like to do as Christians that Jesus told us to do. Do them anyway. Make them your joy. But it's not just singing. Because if worship is just about singing, what, why are we bothering to pray or to confess our common faith? or to partake of the Lord's table, or to baptize, or to give tithes and offerings. What happens very often is when people think of worship, they think about that one part of the worship service when we're singing. And they think that's all that worship includes. But that's just not what Scripture teaches us. Worship encompasses all of those things that we do in the worship service, including listening to a very long sermon that you get slightly bored in. That's still worship. But it's not just what we do in worship services. Worship has to include more than just worship services. For Think about it this way. If you're praying at home, or you're singing when you're alone, hiking on, to, on a trail to God, is that not worship? Or what about the fact that we should be regularly confessing our sins to one another, not just when we gather together as the whole body? Is that not worship? What I want you to see is that worship is far more than all of those things. Uh, Dr. John Piper, who's written extensively on the subject of worship, uh, helps us kind of get a picture of what worship is. He says, worship is the term we use to cover all the acts of the heart and mind and body that intentionally express the infinite worth of God. It's all the acts of heart, mind, and body that intentionally express the worth, the infinite worth of God. This is what we were created for. Do you believe that? Is that what you mean when you say worship? Well, let's unpack it. Let's take that apart and maybe put it into another sentence. Worship is our God-given task. Did you know that Scripture says that for every person? That is your great priority in life? 
That's what you were created for. Isaiah 43, 7, God says, Everyone is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, who I formed and made. Why did God make you? Just ask yourself that question. Why did God give me the 20 or 30 or 15 or 80 or 90 years of my life? What was God's agenda in making me? Well, you don't have to wonder. Scripture says you are created for God's glory. That means your life has one purpose. One thing that it's supposed to be about. You were created to glorify Him. So, worship is our God-given, God-exalting purpose. Every moment of our lives, we should be singing along with those ancient worship leaders who wrote these words, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Notice it's do Him. It's not optional. What do I owe God? I owe Him His glory. It is do Him. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Worship is our God-given, God-exalting, and life-encompassing work. Every moment of our life ought to be about worship. A couple of ways I can talk to you about this. Uh, Scripture is a good way to illustrate this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies... As living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Let those words sink in. What you do with your body is not up to you. Did you know that? How you sleep. How you eat, the people you have sex with. What you do with your body is not yours. Because everything you do with your body is supposed to worship God. And you are to take your life and present it to Him where you are the sacrifice. And you say, God, my life is an offering to you. Another way Scripture puts it is this. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Down to how some of you are going to eat Karen Halterman's pie and Mary Place's surprise dessert, which I won't tell you about tonight, because some of you are in that small group. How you do that is either to God's glory or it's stealing God's glory. Those are your only two options. You're either giving God what He is due or you are taking from Him that which belongs to Him. Do you know what it is to steal from God? By simply not giving Him what He is owed. Worship is our God-given, God-exalting, life-encompassing, proper response to God's infinite glory and worth. What do you need to do to give God that which actually belongs to Him. Scripture puts it this way, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship. Stop for a second. Do you know what that means by implication? That some worship is unacceptable. That God is not interested in you giving Him your leftovers and whatever things you decide you want to offer Him as if God's some accessory. He's the creator of the universe. He's the one who gives you every breath of your life. Everything you own belongs to Him. Therefore, offer unto Him acceptable worship. That which God actually wants with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. That is worship language. You would take your lives in the sacrificial system and you would pick out your best sheep, your best produce, and you would bring it to God and place it on an altar and God would consume that and it would become a sacrifice that was pleasing to Him. But it was always supposed to be a picture of what God wanted from our lives. 
We are the sacrifices that are supposed to be acceptable. And God is the fire that is to consume us. And we are to live for His praise and glory. So the first truth is so key that worship is always our greatest work. But what if I told you it's always our better work? In the NIV, if you go back to the story we started with, Jesus says these words to Martha. He says, Mary has chosen what is better. Now, the ESV says good portion, and there's reasons that both translations choose the words that they're doing. They're trying to communicate a concept wherein Jesus is saying these words. He's saying, Mary has chosen something that is better, yes, but it's also a portion, a offering, a meal that you need to be offering me. You're offering me all these dishes, Martha, but you're not offering me the one thing I actually want. The one thing I actually want. What if you could only worship God if and when He is the greatest satisfaction of your soul? See, a lot of us fail to understand that the essential, vital, indispensable, defining heart of worship it requires us to be satisfied with God. In other words, if you're worshiping God because you want something else, that's not worship. That's manipulation. Only authentic worship of God can satisfy your soul. Did you know that? That's why you do the things that you do. That's why you abuse your bodies with alcohol and drugs. That's why you pursue sexual encounters that seem never to be enough. It's why, no matter how nice your car is, there's always a better one that's out there. It's why, no matter how nice your house is, there's always home improvements or better homes that you could have. It's too big, it's too small. It's why your wardrobe is never quite satisfying enough. Why you can always find another outfit, another set of shoes that could make you feel happy for a moment. It's why your backyard always needs improvements. It's why your friends are never quite living up to your expectations, and no matter what your vacation is like, it was never perfect. Because none of it was intended to satisfy your soul without God. The psalmist says, he says, Without you, there's nothing that is good. Only authentic worship of God can satisfy your soul. That's why so many of you live dissatisfied lives. What if, what if the portion that Jesus is offering, picture this like a piece of pie or a plate full of your favorite food. What if the portion Jesus is offering you is himself? You know, that's a biblical picture. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. He's the thing that actually will satisfy my greatest desires. Or, the psalmist puts it this way, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He's the thing that I've been looking for my whole life. He's my one thing. Or, this way in the Psalms. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. You say, oh, I don't like comparing Jesus to food. Well, let me just point out to you that Jesus actually portrayed his body and blood in material elements, a bread and wine. And then the psalmist says these words, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How long has it been since you've gone to God simply to find your joy in Him? To taste of the Lord and say, Lord, none of these things in my life satisfy me. I come to you hungry, wanting what you alone can give. If we worship God in order to gain something else, I said this earlier, it is not worship. 
It's idolatry. Some of you show up in church because you're hoping that by being here and being a good person that your life will change. You're really not here to, to get God. You're here to get your life changed. It doesn't work that way. Change comes when you come to get God. Some of you are here because it's the religious thing to do, the right thing to do. And by that you mean, if I come here, I will be a good person. And you wonder why you walk away not satisfied because you didn't come here to get God. Some of you, in your life, you read your Bibles in your week time, but you're not here to get God. You're here to get wisdom or knowledge in some way abstract from God. You want to separate out the way to live from getting God. And it never works that way because you're always to go get God first and then He changes how you live. We get things backwards when we go to God and try to gain something from Him, but we don't go to get Him. Here's a third truth about why we worship. We worship because worship is always, always our present and necessary work. Jesus said, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion or the better portion which will not be taken away from her. Worship is always necessary. Do you believe that? It isn't something you do later. It isn't something that you do in a special place or when you don't have other things to do. Yes, I'm busy doing my work right now. I'll worship later. No, you worship in the moment of your work or you don't worship God at all. You don't put off worship. It's always the necessary work. See, in the moment, Jesus is saying, Martha, don't you get it? While you're in there in the kitchen, you're supposed to be worshiping me. You're choosing to not worship me because you're focused on everything else. We'll talk about why in just a minute. But worship is always our necessary work. It's always our present work. It's the work of the moment. Here's a way of thinking about this. If you wake up in the morning and you say, what should I do today? Or moment by moment, you say, what should I be doing right now? What if I told you I can always answer that question? Not because I'm super smart or super wise, but here's the answer. You should be worshiping God. You got an unpaid bill sitting on your d desk? I don't know how you're going to pay the bill. I don't know whether or not you've got enough in your bank account to actually cover it or if you're going to have to go pick up a second job in order to cover your bills. But what I can tell you is in any of those circumstances, you know what you ought to be doing? Worshiping God. Life is going great. Everything's working out for you. Your bank account is full. You've got a nice house. You're in a great romantic relationship with the person that you love. You know what you ought to be doing? Worshiping God. Life isn't going well. Work isn't going well. You've got a bad diagnosis and you just lost one of your most dear relatives. You know what you ought to be doing? Worshiping God. It is always your present work. There is never a moment of your life that you ought not to be worshiping God. The way Martin Luther put it is this, the worship of God should be free at table, that means when you sit down to eat, in private rooms, stop for a second, what do you do when you're truly alone? When nobody sees you? If somebody walked in, would they startle you in the midst of worship? Or would you be worshiping some idol of pleasure? Some idol of comfort? Some experience that you're fantasizing about? In private rooms, you should be worshiping. Downstairs, upstairs, at home, abroad, that means whenever you're outside of your house, in all places, by all people, at all times. That's what you ought to be doing, worshiping. Whoever tells you anything else is lying as badly as the Pope and the devil himself. Nothing quite like Luther being blunt. And he's absolutely right. Worship is always our work. And let me point this out to you. Some of you say, I don't like worship. I would suggest to you that there are several reasons for that. Number one, you want to be the center of your own universe. And number two, you don't know what worship entails. Because worship 
is what you were designed and created for now and forever. It's not something you do to get into heaven. It is the very work of heaven forever. You will never stop worshiping God. Did you know that? You will never stop worshiping God. The way it's put by the prophet Isaiah, from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. That is God's plan for every human being that has ever lived. You will either deny His worship and live forever in hell after your death, or you will worship Him forever. You have two choices. Worship yourself and be under God's condemnation. Worship God. That's your choice. Dr. John Piper wrote a book called Let the Nations Be Glad. It's about missions. It's a book I commend to you. Some of you would be wonderfully blessed by reading it. It has, I think, the best opening paragraph of any book written in the last 50 years. I I just think it's phenomenal. Here's the opening paragraph. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over, and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Are you living that way? So why don't we? Because the truth is, I go through all kinds of days where I barely give worship a second thought. And I'm guessing that's true for most of you. We wander from worship. Just like Martha. If you want to know who you're supposed to identify with in this story, most of us, in fact, all of us, are Martha's. We get distracted from worship all the time. It says there, Martha was distracted with much serving. She went up to Jesus and says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Why don't we worship? We get distracted from worship, right? Like Martha. The word there, perispateo, in Greek means to be dragged away. So here's the question. What's dragging you away from worshiping God with every moment of your life? What is it? Well, fortunately, we can probably categorize these things. We get distracted from a life of worship by several things. Number one, we get distracted from a life of worship by our wants. The truth is we want something more than we want God. That's what we want. What is it that you want more than God? It could be an inappropriate desire or an appropriate desire given too high a priority. It could be some good gift that God's intended to be a way of rejoicing in Him and glorifying Him. Or it could be something that God has said is forbidden to you. It doesn't matter if it takes away from Him and it's not done to Him. It is not yours. The problem is we want the wrong things. We have issues with our wanter. We also have issues with our weight. Now, some of you know that I've been on a weight loss regime myself, but what I don't mean is by what shows on a scale. I mean our sense of self. What distracts us from worshiping God is that we have too high of a sense of ourself. We believe the myth of our own indispensability and our own understanding. Martha assumes in this moment that she understands what is important. Jesus, what's important is not what Mary is doing, it's what I'm doing. Do you hear her indispensability of self? God, don't you know that what I'm doing is what's important? What I'm going through, this painful circumstance, yes, yes, Lord, I know you want worship, but you need to be concerned with what's concerning me. That's what I mean by our weight. Our sense of self. If you ask yourself very often why I'm not worshiping, what you'll find is not just that it's not what you want, it's that you've put yourself in the middle of human history. 
And everything becomes about you. Our pride and our narcissism, our sense of the weight of ourselves rather than the weight of God's glory. And then there's worry. Worry. That's what Martha's doing. Jesus says you're anxious and troubled about many things. We believe ultimately, deep down inside, there's a functional unbelief that says, God's not getting my life right. Or he might not get it right. Have you ever thought about what a ludicrous statement that is? I have to worry because Jesus may not be in control. Oh, the creator of the universe might not be in control. Or maybe you just don't like what he's calling you to worship in. You've got a problem with your boss. You've got a problem in your marriage. You've got a problem with your health. And you're like, well, obviously God doesn't have this right. No, he has it right. You don't have it right. You're worried and anxious because you're not trusting God to do what He wants you to do in that moment, which is to worship Him. By the way, God is not depending on you to fix your world. He is not depending on you to fix your situation. He's not waiting for you to come up with the bright Eureka idea. He's simply calling you to worship Him in every circumstance of life. To depend on Him to fix the problem. Work keeps us from worshiping God. Just busyness. Just busyness. Oh, I'm so busy. Busy with what? Much serving. By the way, religious people, you are the worst at this. Just like me. Just like me. A few weeks ago in staff meeting, Jason and I were talking about worship. And I got convicted because Jason was pointing out some things that were making me uncomfortable a little bit. He's like, Pastor, he's being so polite and so nice. He didn't say it quite this way, but I'll just cut to the chase. He's like, basically, Pastor, you know what your problem is? You're not worshiping during worship. Ouch. Ouch, that hurts. But it's so true. Busy with much serving. Busy with much serving, not worshiping. What are you busy with that's keeping you from worshiping God? You know how many people say, I don't have time to go to church? Just think about it, just church. Family came to town, I'm busy. Oh, really? Jesus didn't know that. You get a worship pass for the day. Or maybe you're supposed to worship with your family. Or worship in being an example to them by calling them to church to hear God's word. What about wondering about other people? Isn't that part of Martha's problem? She's distracted by wondering. What about Mary, Lord? I'm doing all this, but not her. You know how many of us get distracted by wondering about other people? I love the line in uh, C.S. Lewis's The Horse and His Boy when Aslan, the Christ character, is speaking to this one girl and she's asking, well, what about this person? And Aslan, the Christ character, says, I don't tell you their stories. I only talk to you about your story. You know why we're busy sometimes not worshiping? Because we're busy thinking about what God's giving somebody else or not giving somebody else, and we're not worshiping God regardless. We're focused on that. And maybe we're distracted from worship by our weakness. By our weakness. Martha, can't you hear her frustration in this moment? All of you Martha-type personalities out there are kind of like, oh, yes, she's so overwhelmed. I can't do all this on my own. But don't you see, when you worship, Jesus is saying to you, that's right. You can't. You've got to actually depend on me. You can't do this on your own. He's trying to show you something and call you to depend on his all-sufficient power and grace. You can't do it on your own. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's really hard for all of us to hear. A distracted life, a life distracted from worship is fruitless. It's not what God called you to. 
Jesus tells a story about four kinds of soil and a farmer who goes out to sow seed and the seed hits different kinds of soil. The third kind of soil in the parable that Jesus is telling, the seed springs down into the earth, the plant grows up, but it never bears the fruit that it's supposed to have. Why? Because it's surrounded by thorns that choke it out. And then he explains to his disciples what those thorns are. Here's what he says. Those are those who hear the word... But the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things enter in and choke the word of God that should be calling us to live a life of worship and that life proves unfruitful. Some of you get this deep down nagging sense. It wakes you up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Maybe it has a voice that sounds something like this. Is this all there is? And the answer you know is is no, but you don't know why. It's because your life is fruitless because you aren't spending it in worship of God. So, what does worship look like? We should probably spend a few minutes talking about that. What is the way of worship? If, if we're supposed to worship God in our workplaces, in our homes, in our family life, and in every moment of our lives, what does it look like? Well, fortunately, Scripture gives us a few cues. Take a look at Mary here. She, Martha, has a sister called Mary. She sits at the Lord's feet, and she listens to His teaching. Jesus says to her, one thing, to Martha, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. Let's learn some lessons from these sisters. Let's start by learning something from Martha. Why is Jesus in her house? Why? Do you guys miss that? Luke 10, 38? Take a look at it. As they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Don't bag on Martha. She's the one who's actually inviting Jesus into the house. And you know what? So many of us never start on the road to worshiping God with our lives because we don't invite Jesus into our hearts. And by that, I don't mean some salvation experience. I mean a day-in, day-out reality where we are constantly inviting Christ into the moment. When we're at that workplace and we're frustrated with that work problem, are you inviting Christ into that moment? When you're frustrated with a friendship and you're having conflict and you're like, are you inviting Christ into that moment? Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door and let me come in, I will create a banquet there and we will have a dinner together. Worship starts with reception, with inviting Jesus into the moments of your life. If you want to be having a life of worship, you've got to be inviting Jesus into your marriage, into your parenting, into your submitting to your parents. In every moment of life, you've got to be asking Jesus to come into those moments and receiving what He intends, because there is the only place you can begin to worship Him. You've got to receive Him. You've got to adore Him. Worship always includes adoration. It means you're giving to God that which is due Him, and it starts with the right posture. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's a posture of humility. Her body demonstrating what is happening in her heart. She's got a passion for Jesus. She's got a priority for Jesus. Yes, there's meals that need to be done. Yes, there's other things, but I'm sitting here adoring Jesus. Is that what you do when you're at the ball game? Some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, let me try and give you an illustration. I've used this before because it's such a wonderful moment. I told Nick this this week, I don't know how long God will grace me to remember this moment, but I hope it's a long, long time, and maybe into eternity I can add that to my list of praises because I have this clear picture in my head of sitting at a dinner with Nick and a group of the leaders here in this church, and we were having this most glorious tiramisu. It was amazing. And I was having bites and I was just, so, it was so good. And I will never forget this moment. Nick turns and he looks at me and he had this smile. It was all the way across his face. And he said, this is just a shadow. I knew immediately what he meant. He was worshiping. Oh God, Tiramisu is such a great gift. Are you adoring God in those great moments and 
Maybe like Job, are you being invited to adore God when he's taken everything out of your life? Do you rend your robes and fall at the feet of God? And you say, nothing in my life is going the way I planned it, but I will worship you. That's adoration, the posture, passion, and priority of our hearts. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. If you want to continue on this way of worship, not only do you have to receive Jesus and adore Him, you must contemplate Him. Mary is listening to His teaching. Are you listening to the voice of Jesus? Some people are like, oh, I don't know why I have such a hard heart towards worship. And I ask them, well, have you read God's Word this week? Oh, no. I need to get the heart of worship first. No, you don't. That's not how that works. You need to be hearing Jesus speak. You need to be encountering Him in His Word. You want to contemplate His Word. Bring it into your life. Reflect upon it. Oh, Jesus, what are you teaching me about this moment? I'm crying out for your wisdom. Open up the book. Contemplate it. And then confess the truth about yourself and about God. God, I'm a sinner in need of your grace. Worship always includes confession. And no, I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic perspective on that, where you go into a booth and tell a priest what your sins are, and he gives you punishment for it. That is not confession. Confession is saying, God, I am a sinner in need of your grace. I know the truth about myself and I know the truth about who you are. You, as I've contemplated your word, you've shown me my heart. You've shown me who I am. You've shown me, as the Holy Spirit is showing some of you right now, that I am not a worshiper. And I was built for a life of worship and you are infinitely worthy of worship. What if I told you Martha? Martha has a beautiful example of confession. And she does it in the hardest moment of her life. In John chapter 11, we have the record of what happens when Jesus loves people. He loves Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. They get a report. Martha and Mary have written a letter or sent some verbal report. Jesus, come quickly. Lazarus, whom you love, is dying. He's dying, Lord. And the Bible's very clear to record that Jesus was within a couple of days' journey, but Jesus waits four days until Lazarus is good and dead and buried in a tomb before he shows up. That sounds like love, does it? And Jesus enters the village, and here comes Martha, Martha the receiver, inviting Jesus into the encounter, meeting him outside the village, receiving her Savior. And she has this moment, she says, Lord, if you'd been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. My brother wouldn't be dead. He wouldn't be rotting and stinking in a tomb. By the way, she is the one who actually says, Lord, he stinketh. That's how dead he is. And Jesus says to her, some wonderful things. I, Martha, in the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Question. Do you believe? Do you believe this? Jesus has revealed himself. Martha's had a chance to contemplate it a fraction of a second. Do you believe that I am who I say I am? That it doesn't matter that Lazarus is rotting in a tomb, that I am the Son of God. Now, here's something so important. There are three, in all of Scripture, there are three recorded confessions of the deity of Jesus Christ amongst His disciples. One from Nathaniel at the beginning of his ministry, Two from Peter in the middle of his ministry. And here, a woman of no account is asked. And she gives what theologians call the most complete statement about the divinity of Jesus Christ. She says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, though my brother is dead, though my life is not turning out the way I want it to, though life is hard, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, come into this world. I don't care that my life isn't working out the way I wanted it to. You're still on the throne. Now that's confession. And if your worship isn't leading you to that kind of belief, it's not worship. 
Worship must always include rejection. Rejection of other gods. We call this sometimes repentance. You see this in an account that happened just a few days after Jesus does raise Lazarus, which by the way, remember, Martha didn't know was going to happen. But Jesus does raise Lazarus from the grave and there's this moment when this great dinner is happening and Mary interrupts the dinner and she comes in and she takes a vial of perfume. Now this perfume is far more expensive than any Chanel number no. 5. We are told by its current estimated value this is $40,000. $40,000 in contemporary currency. She snaps the neck of the perfume bottle. This is a breaking here. Most theologians and scholars believe this is her inheritance. This is what her parents passed on to her. This is supposed to give her, as a single woman, financial security for the rest of her life to be able to dollop this out bit by bit and sell off bits of perfume. This is supposed to be her legacy forever. This is her security. She breaks the bottle. She pours it over the head of Jesus and over his feet. And she lets down her hair and she wipes his feet with her hair. The house is filled with the aroma of the pure nard. Mary is rejecting all other hope. She's rejecting everything else and saying it's not important. So what are you holding on to in your life? What's giving you security, sag- significance, or satisfaction? What gives your life purpose, value, security? True worship must always include the rejection of other gods. You say, I want to worship Jesus, but I want to keep these other things. It doesn't work that way. I want to worship Jesus, but I want to keep sleeping with my girlfriend. It doesn't work that way. Your life isn't about worship. I want to keep worshiping Jesus, but I don't want to be kind to my unkind husband. It doesn't work that way. I want to worship Jesus, but I don't want to be out loud about my faith in the workplace. It doesn't work that way. You have one choice. Reject your other gods and worship Him. So what are your other gods? Is it comfort, wealth, sex, power, food? What is it that you think is worth rejecting Jesus for? What will your worship cost you? There's a moment, a moment in the life of David when he encounters a divine angel and he's offering up this site and he's offered this site to build an altar to God and the man's giving it to him and he says to the man Ornan, he says, no, no. No, no, I will not take for the Lord what is yours. Some of us are worship second-handers. We take what other people have done to prepare their hearts for worship and we live off of that. We're like leeches of other people's worship experiences. But David says, no, I will not do that. I will not do that. I will not offer a burnt offering to God that costs me nothing. People are like, oh, it's so hard to get up to go to church. Really? Really? Is your worship supposed to cost you nothing? It's uncomfortable sitting there for an hour and a half. Is your worship supposed to cost you nothing? I can't. If if I give the money I think God's telling me to give to the church, I won't be able to buy all the pizza I want. Is your worship supposed to cost you nothing? That's the way some of us worship. And because we've rejected the other gods, we've got to glorify God in everything. Worship is always about glorification. It's about inviting other people to rejoice in the God that we've encountered. We want other people to see and to know the supreme value of God. In that moment, when Martha or Mary pours out that perfume, you know what? People are mad about it. They don't like the act of worship. They're mad. They say, what a waste. What a waste. Can't believe she's doing that. Jesus says... Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And then he says, And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, the good news about me is told, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Now, you can read that statement wrongly. You can say Jesus is saying, Oh, her act of worship is just so important. Everybody wants to remember Mary. You know what's interesting? Only John identifies her as Mary. Yet this story is recorded in two other Gospels. And they don't even give her name because the point isn't the name of the woman. It's the one who is worthy of such extravagant worship. Does your life glorify God in such a way that people say, I don't get it. 
Why would you reject comfort or pleasure or power or influence or wealth? Do people look at your life and ask that question and go, what a waste? And then are they drawn to the one who's worth spending your life on? That's glorification. And your worship should always lead there. And it should ultimately result in transformation. Some of you say, I've got desperate problems, Pastor. I need to change this. I need to clean up my life before I'm ready to worship God. Don't you understand? It doesn't work that way. Worship is the only way your life is going to be changed. The problem is you're worshiping the wrong things. And until your worshiper gets fixed, nothing in your life will change. You might become a highly moral or ethical person, but you'll still be worshiping your own will. You'll be worshiping religion. You'll be worshiping your own power. Your problem is your wrong worship. You want your life to be transformed and changed? Worship the right things. The way it's put in 2 Corinthians is this. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God. When we see the beauty and majesty and power of God, that's worship, we are being transformed in that moment into the same image, the image of Jesus Christ, from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The key to life transformation is worship. So who is worthy of such worship? Every life has a direction. Every life has an arrow sign pointing somewhere. Where would yours point? Would it point to yourself? Your desires? Would it point to the power that is out there in politics? Would it point to wealth? Or self-sufficiency? Or sexuality? Or sincerity or earnestness? Where would your arrow point to Jesus said about Mary pouring out the perfume, she has done a beautiful thing to me. How many of you can go to bed each night and say, I live today to Jesus. When I worked, I did it to Jesus. When I was with my wife or my husband and I was doing the dishes, I did it to Jesus. When I was raising my kids, I did it to Jesus. When I taught at school, it was to Jesus. When I studied at school, it was to Jesus. Whatever it is that God's called me to do, I did it to Jesus. Every life has a direction. And I want to tell you that Jesus is alone the sufficient, soul-satisfying, life-altering, appropriate object of worship. Who is worthy of being pointed to in every moment of your life? It's Jesus Christ. The question you should ask is why? Here's why. Here's why. Because He is the Son of God come into this world to shed His blood to wash you and me clean of our sins, to fix our broken worship models. He's the only one who can set us free from worshiping the wrong things and turn our heart to... Him alone. And to say, yes, I'm going to bring you to God that you might worship Him. He alone has borne the penalty for your false worship and my false worship. He took the wrath of God that we deserve and He took it upon Himself. He lived the perfect life of worship. Only Jesus has lived a life of worship and as the great high priest entered behind the veil that was in the temple and there in spirit offered up the one life of true sacrifice Himself as the great Lamb of God. And that makes Him the object of of all worship forever. You want to peek into heaven? You want to see what it's like? You want to know what it looks like? Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus is presented before the throne of God Almighty as a lamb who is slain. And around the throne are infinite myriads of angels and divine creatures and the elders and the apostles of the church down through the ages. And they're singing, they're singing, some of you that have a problem with singing and worship, here you go. They're singing a new song. Worthy, 
Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You, Jesus, alone are worthy. The worship service pauses. There's some things that happen, and then in seven, it gets picked up again. The worship service now, even bigger. Now, the throngs of every redeemed person down throughout the ages comes before the throne of God. And here's what they're doing. I looked, John says, and behold, a great multitude. No one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, and they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they're clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they're crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. That's why you worship. And if your vision of Jesus is anything less than that, you will not worship Him. Jesus said, Mary has chosen, chosen to worship me. So who will you and I choose to worship each day of our lives? T today, right now. Right now. Who will you choose to worship? David Foster Wallace, famous novelist, award-winning novelist, gave a commencement address at Kenyon College. He said something remarkable for a professed agnostic who had no real belief in any one religious system. David would go on to take his own life tragically. But in this commencement address to all of these young graduates, he said, I want you to understand something. Your life is about worship. Everybody worships. The only choice we get, the only choice we get is who or what we are going to worship. Every moment of your life already is a worship service. The only question is, what is it you are worshiping? Is it God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, who has shown the light of His grace by the working of His Holy Spirit, even now into some of your hearts and lives? Are you like the psalmist? Could you say, there's one thing on my heart every time it beats. One thing I have asked of the Lord. So many of us, we go before God, God, I want this, I want that, God, give me this, give me that. No, the psalmist says, I want one thing. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Is that your prayer? God, I want nothing else for my life. I don't care whether or not I have a big bank account. I don't care whether I have a comfortable house. I don't care whether you call me to die. I don't care. What I want is to be in your presence, to gaze upon your beauty, to worship you every moment. And if you don't have that heart and you're crying out for it, go to Jesus. And say, this is just not true of me yet. But I want to know you in such a way that every time my heart beats and every breath that I take, it expresses this, I worship you. Let's pray. Let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, would you give us that kind of heart? I, whew, boy, Lord, we're, we're not rejecting the right things. We're contemplating the wrong things. We're adoring the wrong things. Uh, we confess to you that we are bad worshipers in desperate need of a redirected worship center of our lives. We need new hearts, new minds. And we praise you because you sent your son to live that life of perfect worship, to die the death we could not die, to be raised from the tomb, to give us a life of worship. And oh God, many of us have been failing to live that and we confess that to you. We repent and we cry out to you in faith and say, Lord, make me into the worshiper that you created me to be. I so desperately need to be that that my soul may be satisfied in you and in you alone. 
And I pray for anybody who's not praying that prayer right now that you would bring such conviction and emptiness and calling upon them that their hearts, their lives are turned to delight in you above all else. Oh God, have this mercy upon us. And there in your presence, grant us greater satisfaction than we could have ever imagined. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.